Welcome to Pros and Cons, a podcast by writers for writers, brought to you by Precipice Fiction. Precipice Fiction would like to acknowledge the people of the Eora and Dorag nations as the original custodians and storytellers of the land this podcast was created on. Um, welcome to the Pros and Cons podcast, and today you have your unusual host, Matan, taking over once more. And I have two extremely talented people sitting metaphorically in front of me. Um, Ali Bornham. Hello. Good morning. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> and the one and only James. Hello. Uh, how are you on this lovely morning here in Israel, which is an afternoon in Australia? An afternoon, yes. No, for those playing at home several months behind, we're recording this the day after the Australian election um so we're ushering in a new government so everyone's a little bit buzzed and happy (laughs) just for uh, any occasional time travelers what year uh 2022 (laughs) (laughs) okay just in case you're you're not sure when you stepped out of the portal um (laughs) we have got a great episode for you we're gonna discuss something uh super super important i know i say that every time but we're going to discuss character flaws, why they're necessary, what is even a character flaw, and why it is a good thing to have as many as you can in your novel. Um, I'm going to start by straight up asking my uh, colleagues here, Ali and James, how do you see a character flaw? What is even a character flaw to you? And most importantly, why do you think it's necessary? Broad question, Matan. <laughs> Very broad. <laughs> um, no, I, so I went away and had to think about this because um, you're a lovely host who shoots through topics ahead of time. Um, and uh, like what, what does it add to a story to give your characters flaws? And I, I was kind of thinking about the difference between a flawed hero and a flawed villain and how they, they, that kind of has they mean two different things to me. Um, so for to give a villain flaws, in a sense, humanizes them. But that is the reason why you would give uh, a, a villain flaws. Uh, thinking of flaws differently as to just bad traits, because if they're just bad traits, the universe isn't punishing them. They're just they're not necessarily flaws that are making their life hard for themselves. That it's just how they are. It, it's almost like the universe, the the lens of your world needs to have a bit of a, a judgment value in how it's viewing them. Um, so a, a flaw is is making their life hard, and the plot is almost punishing them for having this flaw. Otherwise, if they're just being a dick. It's and the the universe is letting them get away with this bad character trait. It's not necessarily a flaw, is it? Um, and, and similar for a hero. For me, almost a flaw then needs to be a plot driver. Is the most useful way I distilled it to myself because I'm like a, a character flaw is going to get them into trouble. Uh, I really like how you have these. Uh, you looked at it on both sides of the coin. You say a flaw is not the same for the protagonist as it is for the villain. You see, for me. For the protagonist, it is almost the obstacle on the way to what the protagonist wants to have. Mm. The protagonist wants to uh, cure their sick mother. Maybe the flaw is that they just can't tell a lie and they really need to tell a lie to get the medicine and they just cannot do it for some reason and it keeps getting them into troubles. While for the uh, villain, if we're guessing that his uh, ambition is to take over Camelot, Maybe the flaw is that he likes to feed orphans and that is getting in the way of his uh, taking over. Uh, uh, not maybe the best example, but hopefully our listeners. Okay. But that would, he, the universe would be punishing him. Like he, on his way to achieving his goal, he can't do it because he's like, why do I keep stopping to feed orphans? It's, it's slowing me down. Why does the universe keep giving me orphans? Yeah. And and I kind of love that it also, so being a plot driver for me dictates the difference between it being a tragedy or a comedy. And I'm using the comedy in the sense Mm. of just a story that has a happy ending. So if, as you said, Matan, the hero can't get over the floor, you're in tragedy town. That's the structure of your plot. But if they do, you're, you're in comedy town. 
so we got the we got the major flaw, we got the minor flaw, which is maybe that person just stutters. Uh, which sometimes uh, minor flaws, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, are just here to make the character memorable, a bit more round, whereas the major flaw is here to get in the way of what the character wants. And like Ali was touching on, a tragic flaw or a fatal flaw is kind of here to stay until the very bitter end. Uh, James, what do you think about the flaws and what they're good for? I'm loving listening to the two of you talking about it because I think you have a much better grasp on how to use flaws, uh, certainly, than I do. I would often think of a, I guess I feel like the flaws, if they're not the thing that I'm basing a character on, they tend to be something that I've written in afterwards, so the way of balancing the character out. I quite like uh, if you have a character who's maybe very adept in one area, there's gonna call, that's going to cause a flaw and that they won't be as adept in another area. I think a common one is like the warrior character, who's maybe a great soldier, he falls down when he has to maybe come and socialize with other characters in some way, or maybe he's not very good at convincing people to do what he wants. And that's why he's become such a good warrior character and things like this. I also love um, if the flaw is like you were saying, kind of central to who the character is, if it is something that is driving them into the plot, if the reason for why the character has gotten involved in what's going on or why they've chosen to get involved in what's going on is actually because of some failing in them or because of some, slightly immoral thing that they want that they're kind of trying to do the moral thing in order to really get this on the side now i find that very engaging very interesting ah if I, if i'm allowed to expand on that matan it 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 reminds me of a really what what james is saying about the idea that if you've made a character really competent in one area in the the redrafting is your opportunity to go back and make them not as good at something else um now, there's this handy little tool that I um, trot out to beginner writers um, when I'm teaching, and it's basically uh, called the character like composition sliders. And it's just this theory that all characters are made of like three different sliders. So think of them on like a soundboard between one and a hundred where you can place these sliders. Um, but one of them is competency, the other's likability, and the other's proactivity. So competency is how skilled your character is um, in just either they're your Sherlock Holmes, like they've, they've specked out, they're really good at something. That's their competency bar. Likeability. Now, the trick to think about likability is more just like traits, as in they are a nice person. They go out of their way to help other people. In theory, they should be likable. So just put a barrier between the idea of likable and audience reaction for a second and just think of likable as good traits, um, and proactivity is then how much agency the character has in achieving their goal. Like, are they actually going about doing things to achieve things? Is their proactivity slider? To then show what their opposite is, a, comp a character who's not competent is your bumbling fool, idiot, comic relief character. Um, your unlikable character is now you're in villain territory. They're, you know, they're they say mean things. They're morally grey. They they make they make other people feel bad. If you met them on the street, you wouldn't like them. They're an asshole. Um, and then proactivity is a character with not a lot of agency. They're just they're going to sit around and plot happens to them. You know what I'm thinking? I'm just imagining this extremely competent, likable uh, couch potato. Who's just yeah, like, yeah. yeah not, <laughs> not doing anything. He he could solve. He could fix all of our problems if he would only just do something. <laughs> Sure. Uh, yeah. Just to expand on the theory. So the idea is a protagonist will usually have two of these sliders quite high, but one quite low. And so it's like, we like them. They're the protagonist. They've got two high ones, but they're human because one of these is low. If you have all three sliders high, that's when you're kind of in like your Marty Stu, Mary Sue territory where, oh, well, the character's just too good. They're good at everything. And that actually an audience won't relate to them if they've got all the sliders quite high. Um, and typically with villains, they will be incredibly proactive. They'll be incredibly competent, but it's their likability slider that's low because they're making bad choices. So, so the three great examples I like to trot out is, so say Batman as a protagonist has high competency, high proactivity, but his likability is technically low because sometimes he does morally great things. Um, I reached for Alina from Shadow and Bone. I don't know if anyone knows that, but that that's a show that oh, yeah, the protagonist yeah. gets accused of having low proactivity. So she's highly competent. She's the most magical, powerful person they've discovered. 
she has high likability in the sense that, you know, she's a nice person, is nice to people, but her productivity is low. So if people are, like are not relating to that character, it's usually people have a real problem with low proactive right. protagonists. Um, and then Mr. Bean is a good example of a low competency character. Wait, 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 wait. The, the Mr. Bean? Like John the English? Mr. Bean, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, pro- proceed, proceed. Uh, highly likable. He's a nice guy. He's incredibly proactive in going after his goals, <laughs> but he's low competency and that he's a bumbling full comedic character. Um, so, yeah, so that's the sliders. I just wanted to quickly shovel that in because that's a fun way to find your missing flaw if you find you, you've already like specked your character out and you're like well what can I make their flaw what direction <laughs> you know from all from all the name drops and characters uh, we ever used to get a point across the fact that Ali just used uh, Alina Starkov and Mr. Bean in the same sentence I think it just shows that this is a great topic for a podcast if there was any doubt um, yeah James you wanted to to add to that um probably something that we might struggle back on but just that example of um really confident really likable but a low productivity is often a character that has perhaps the flaw of maybe being too old for being able to take part in the in the action of the story the kind of common examples are like mentors but i really like that uh, i really like that character maybe has a ton of knowledge but they can no longer use it because maybe they're past the point where they can so their productivity is very good but they can assist other characters that way I think the mentor is a great archetype because it really shows you this uh, super competent, sometimes not very likable, uh, just person that's kind of done with the world. They're kind of, they're not interested anymore. We've seen these old wizards in the little huts just drinking strange uh, moonshine. You know, they're not interested in the dark Lord and that kind of stuff. On the opposite end of the spectrum, a very common archetype is the young hero who is likable, does want to do stuff, is just not very good yet. And it's kind of interesting for us to see them overcome that, uh, we'll call it the lack of competency and become better. But if, if we're going back to, uh, to flaws that are more akin to what Alice said about the universe punishing you for a flaw that you have, can you think about heroes or protagonists, not necessarily heroes, that had these flaws that you felt like punished them, uh, just kept getting in their way or ultimately led to them not managing their goal. Um, just off the top of my head, uh, the Count of Monte Cristo, uh, the, the guy, uh, Edmond Dantes, his fatal f- flaw, fatal, his big flaw is that he's just consumed by vengeance. And as the story progresses, you think to yourself, okay, if he doesn't let go of this, there's no happy ending here. Now in the movie version, he does kind of get over the vengeance things. It's like, okay, I'm not going to shoot the guy who stole my wife and ruined my life. And then he has to shoot him anyway. But that was a bit of a cop out. But the point is, he didn't want to shoot the guy. Okay. He was going to let him go. You know, the classic, you know, Green Goblin sends the glider at Spider Man and gets stabbed. That kind of moment. What, what do you think about these flaws with our protagonists that are kind of getting in the way? They're, they're my favorite. Um, so how I, what I always try to aim for in my writing when creating a character flaw is something that is a trait of the character that is simultaneously the thing that always gets them into trouble, but is also the trait that will get them out of trouble. And I love that duality um, as, as a plot driver. Uh, so, so for example, um, I, I'm watching, uh, his name is Thomas Shelby from Peaky Blinders. Oh, Shelby. Great. I'm just like, if I work backwards, I'll get it. Thomas Shelby from Peaky Blinders is, so all of his kind of flaws are the things that will set the plot in motion uh, at the start of each season. So either he's he's harmed someone and he's created some enemies or he's, reached too far above his station and he's just set some things in motion he's betrayed the wrong person well, what would you say is the, is the human trait that is leading to those mistakes is, is it anger is it what is it, is, is it yeah he's so how they set up thomas shelby is he, he always has this war mentality like he's never quite been able to escape the pdst uh of uh his time in france so it leaves him as quite ruthless single-minded and so he's bringing that war mentality to 
all his everyday interactions with his family, with his business, and he can't escape that. Um, and, and, and that it'll always boil down to Thomas Shelby's creating problems for himself because of his war mentality. But by the end of the season, he defeats the enemies. He gets out of that tricky situation because of his ruthless war mentality. So I, I love that it's simultaneously the thing that causes the trouble and gets him out of trouble. And that it's a, it's a satisfying loop as a viewer. So the lesson is you, it's okay to have a flaw as long as you're competent enough not to get killed. <laughs> yeah, well, it, again, that's the difference between a tragedy and a comedy, right? Um, but he's, he's not necessarily overcoming the flaw, though, but he's, he's victorious because of the flaw. So that's almost like the third option. He's not overcoming it, but he's, he's successful despite and because of it. Yeah, that's a great show, Epic of Learners. Uh, James, what do you think? Kind of taking it in the other direction where the character... It ends up as a tragedy. I'm always thinking of like Ned Stark and mm. how his one of his greatest qualities was that he was so noble and dutiful and kind of honorable. But this is, of course, also his flaw because they put yes. him in an environment where these are not suitable skills to have. And these are actually massive limitations for him. Um, and you kind of don't realize that until it's too late. And then they kind of it's a quality in the north, and it's a it's a fatal flaw in the south. Basically, mm. Ned Stark is this. For those of you who have uh, not had the chance to watch Game of Thrones or read uh, five books, what happens is Ned Stark is this, uh, this lord coming from the north to help his king buddy in the south to kind of run the kingdom. Ned is this goody two-shoe, he's a really nice guy, very honorable, and he needs to play this political game and he just can't do it. And it does lead to uh, an unfortunate case of beheading. Which he does not shake off. <laughs> he does not, it is not just a scratch. Um, poor Ned. But we just lap it up and we like, give me more fatal flaws, Mr. Martin. Um, yeah, his son had a fatal flaw too. His son, uh, Rob Stark, what was his fatal flaw? What, do you, what would you call it? Well, it's the same kind of, it's the honour that he's, so he's trying to fill Ned's shoes. And so he gets himself into a situation with a woman um, and he thinks this, the honourable thing to do would be to marry her um, and, you know, not create more bastard kids like my dad did that cause troubles in my families. Um, so, and being that honourable um, is also what, is is also the undoing of Rob Stark uh, again because it's just that uh, that failure to play the game that the rest of the world is playing. The universe is punishing them. So, so again, it's the it's th this outside tragic lens that's going to cause a value judgment. Even though honourable being trusting people in other circumstances would be a good trait, the universe is punishing them for it in this situation. And it is almost their honour that has people back them and follow them into war and it's almost a thing that builds them gives them their power but then it is also the thing that you know the other side of the coin causes the downfall as well one character that interestingly does kind of overcome it at least in the show he does get shivved uh he gets shivved in the show too but what does overcome is Jon snow because he kind of does the dishonorable thing a few times um he doesn't kill the Yigrid, he doesn't kill the girl, even though that she's, uh, what do you call them, a wildling. He, he invites them to participate. He kind of does a lot of shoddy things. He talks to Mans Raider. He, he kind of crosses the line between what is okay for a lord or a noble to do. And that kind of allows him to go further than either his father or his brother has managed to go, which is like... Isn't that somewhat down to the fact that like as a character, he kind of grows and changes an awful lot as the story goes on. He kind of has mm. to confront an awful lot of flaws. And in the next book, it's a different thing that's causing problems. Yes. So, so uh, Game of Thrones is really interesting because I sat down to try and think of Game of Thrones characters and I realised I couldn't engage with characters whose arcs aren't complete yet. So I'm not considering the show ending canon. I, I need to wait until, to know how George is going to close those arcs because so much of what George is doing is these are fable characters. So you don't really get a sense of what their flaw is until that arc ends. So we, we can judge Ned Stark. We can judge Rob Stark. We know what their fable is because their arc completed. They're done. Someone like John, we don't know what his fable is. So, so this is where 
I think flaws are inherently tied to plot in we're not fully going to get a sense of what John's flaw is until the plot ends. Like it, it's hard. It, it was hard for me to come in and identify what his was until it ended. Could be there. We're just not seeing it. <laughs> Re- it could be. It, it, and we're going to be like, that's what it is all along. But I just, and I'm going to point out, uh, for people who like structure like I do, this is what I find a fundamental difference between television and, say, a series writing books, is I can talk to Thomas Shelby's Fatal Floor, even though that show's not technically finished yet, um, because the season television structure needs to have that end and reset. Um, so that is a character who's going to go through the same cycle again and again. That's how a television story engine works. Mm. Um, Game of Thrones is not a story engine. It is one single story told across many, 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 many books. Um, and, and, and that's the plotting difference. And that's why almost television characters need to come pre-packaged with a flaw that's always going to get in their way, while book characters across a series are allowed to develop and change and until the very end. I like how you touched on how television um, is different in terms of story arc than novels. I think we've all felt it, uh, which is kind of the downside of some television shows that are really well written. They're really good. Mm-hmm. But you're like, haven't I seen this character deal with selfishness already? Haven't I seen this guy deal with uh, insecurity before? It's like, again, we're going to go through this. He, he had this really great moment two seasons ago and now again he's having it because yeah. it's television yes you can only yeah. go so far it's just a different fundamental structure writers are writing to yeah absolutely <laughs> game of thrones made me think of it so uh when i was sitting down brainstorming trying to think of characters who you know we admire because they have great flaws and they're great examples of flaws i really had to wreck my brain for female characters um and i, I kind of had a moment of like introspection stepping back and being like why is that um and, and i don't know i don't i don't have the answers i think it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing about like either i don't know history uh, writing characters have just we've had more opportunities for more complex male characters or if there's just a fundamental like it's less accepting of flaws in female characters and or if complexity is more celebrated in male characters I don't know I I just wanted to step away and be like look it was interesting that I really had to rack my brain to think of female character examples Uh, Antigone jumps to mind as a (laughs) character with a flaw but uh, speaking of tragic flaws outside of Uh, your big Shakespeare tragedies yeah yeah you know, it's interesting. Uh, I wonder I wonder why is that? And I'm sure that if we sit down here, we can come up with a few. Well, uh, how about uh, The Way of Kings, okay? Um, wh- what do you make of uh, Shalan, right? Yeah, like this isn't to say that female characters don't have flaws, but it was more just like the big tentpole characters we were going to organically reach for in this conversation. I wanted, I was going to tick off how many male characters we named um, before we organically hit a female character, just for my own interest. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, just how it is. Um, and, and I guess I've got a small axe to grind in that direction. It's why I've, I don't know if I've successfully done it yet, but in Majesty, I, I've, I'm trying to write an incredibly flawed, partic- maybe not very likable main female character and just trying to solve that. Like, I just want to explore that space. I find it very interesting. Well, well, well no spoilers, but your, your uh, work in progress novel does have quite a few great female characters. One that I'm uh, somewhat uh, having a toxic relationship with that I love her and she's probably going to break my heart. <laughs> Uh, yeah, stay which, away from that one, guys. You, you'll 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 know her when you read her. Um, which character is this? Oh, <laughs> uh, you know which one. You know which one. The starts with an L, ends with a knife in your gut. You know? <laughs> I, there were a couple, so I'm like, okay, that one, fantastic. <laughs> if we went, to, if we already went into our writing, uh, I was gonna ask you two questions. Please answer in no particular order. Um, what is your pet peeve? What character flaws you kind of make you cringe either reading or writing them? Uh, sometimes maybe you write them without noticing, like maybe the guy who's just too honest for his own good or the girl who just likes everybody a little too much and cannot stop making cookies for people, uh, even though she needs to study for her exam. Um, and on the other hand, tell me the ones you really like writing. 
uh, maybe you really like writing the alcoholic or the grumpy mentor or just the guy who kicks puppies when he's walking around. Um, I'm not going to judge you for anything you say here. Our listeners might. I had a really tough time coming up with flaws that I don't like seeing. And I was trying to think <laughs> of that because if I come across something where I feel like maybe the characters aren't well written, do I kind of stop engaging with it? Or do I just love, do I just see flaws as just things that just make for a more and more complex character? So I just get suckered in no matter what it is. Um, but one thing that I did come across was, um, just because I think it's very poorly written, is often mental health issues are often very um, kind of hammed up in a, a lot of works, uh, sometimes in books and then sometimes in TV as well. I feel like they're often inconsistent with like how the uh, mental health issue can often be and sometimes used as a justification for erratic behavior and stuff like that. Can you come up with an example that you like? Uh, um, would you like to write that as well? Um, I do dabble in it, but I feel like it requires like a, a tremendous amount of research and then you kind of want to be conscious of the situation you're putting the character in. I write an awful lot of post-apocalyptic stuff, so I try to kind of almost bear in mind that the characters would be quite damaged from having survived. So I tend to write a little bit of PTSD into my characters, but it is a matter mm -hmm. of trying to get the research right and trying to figure out, is this something that needs to be consistent within the character? And you can't just have, well, in this chapter, I'm going to have their PTSD be a part of them. And then in this chapter, I need them to perform along these lines. So the PTSD is going to be toned down. You kind of need it to be pretty persistent and really tied into like who the character is. Before we go into Ali's answer, I really want to touch on what you said about the consistency with character flaws, because it's so easy, you know, uh, for writers, we write chapter one, we make this guy, uh, whatever flaw we gave him, he's rude, he's an alcoholic, he's, uh, he's got PTSD. It's, it's sometimes it's easy to get lost in the plot and kind of forget that this guy needs to be this in this way. And it's really important, I think, to kind of preserve the way this character is built and make sure all his, his or her interactions kind of remain uh, true and loyal to that flaw and not just let it slide away. Uh, because I think uh, if I write a character long enough, it starts to sound like me. Eventually, eventually the dialogue is going to sound like, sound like me. The actions are going to be like me. And I kind of have to, you know, fish them back to where they're supposed to be, which is not me because nobody wants to read about a book about me talking to myself. But yeah, that's just about consistency. Um, thank you, James. Ali, what do you got for us? Yeah, um, I, I kind of want to expand on what James said because I think that's a really good point. Um, but I will backtrack and apologize for implying that Antigone was written by Shakespeare. I realized like in my <laughs> head, I ran through like, you know, Taming of the Shrew and all the other Shakespeare examples I could have named. And I just, the listeners would have gone straight from Antigone to Shakespeare and that would have sounded super dumb. <laughs> so I just wanted to correct, correct that. We'll, we'll cut it out in the editing. It will just be your voice just kind of... Uh... The, the same guy who wrote Oedipus, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Greek canon and then the Shakespeare canon, you know, the tragedies. Anyway, anyway. Um, yeah, no, I think James raises a really good point because something I've been quite uh, sensitive to um, in some of the things I've written and published uh, is uh, physical disability um, and wanting to represent uh, physical disability, normalise it, um, showcase it on the page, um, but not tie it into a character flaw. Um, and for that to that being a really hard to swallow, just something we don't have an appetite for that we want to watch in our media anymore, I don't think. Um, so Unsound uh, features um, deaf characters, uh, deaf, deaf actors portraying deaf characters, um, and say it, it forms part of the obstacles of the story. Um, but in no way uh, is their deafness ever portrayed as something they need to overcome <laughs> or it, it's, it's not a fatal flaw in any way. Um, so that, yeah, that I, I'm incredibly mindful of is, is the difference between, yes, it, including something like that, normalising it, making a part of the story, yes, using it as parts of the element if, say, they're butting up against the world, if the world has prejudices they have to deal with, um, but it's not something, it, it's the prejudices they're, you know, working to solve, problems other people have they're trying to solve, not problems within themselves. Um, 
Yeah. So that otherwise in terms of other character flaws, um, I'm sick of seeing. Uh, something I've just coined to myself, I call the Skylar effect. Um, Skylar from Breaking Bad. I had a feeling. Okay. <laughs> I connected the right way. Uh, you know, there aren't that many Skylars in fiction. <laughs> but which Skylar? Uh, I, a lot of people are going to um, disagree with this, uh, but I Skylar annoys the absolute shit out of me as a character. And I don't think she's a very well-written character in an otherwise very well-written show. And I think what bothers me is that she will always pivot to be the antagonistic voice or she will always pivot to be in opposition to the protagonist um, with no through line that actually makes sense. So she is a character that exists just to always be, you know, the opposite magnetic force of wherever the protagonist is. And without ever, like, she can just jump from position to position to argument to argument and it doesn't make sense and it's infuriating to watch. And she's meant to be in a really annoying a character and that also gets my hackles raised the idea that like the wife is meant to create that primal hatred in you as the watcher um so they're, they're throwing her under the bus like that by making her this magnetic opposite um anyway it drives me insane so whenever i see it in other media it's i call it the skylar effect i'm like they've gone and skylared that character and that makes me so mad <laughs> I think you voiced what a lot of us felt when watching Breaking Bad is that one character just didn't get the fair end of the quick help me with a uh, the, the fair end of the straw. Is that a thing? It should be <laughs> the fair know. end of the straw. Uh, the fair <laughs> end of the straw. Please make sure everybody get the same nice uh, ends for their straws. Do not give them shitty ends. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, I was trying to plug in a bit of more of your writing, guys, and we're going to get to that. At the end, I'm going to ask you about your writing slash reading. Um, even though, uh, you know, consistent listeners will know I should have done it at the beginning of the podcast, we will do it in the end, and that's okay. Um, we're going to play a game that you guys were not made aware that we're going to play. Oh, God. On purpose. Uh, <laughs> I have a list, uh, courtesy of Google listeners. If you Google, you will probably find the same list of character flaws. 70 of them, Ali is going ahead and Googling it. <laughs> uh, 70 <laughs> character flaws. We are going to play Rate the Flaw. Oh, now here's the thing you're allowed to pick a number from one to 10, but you got to shout it as soon as I say the flaw. You're not allowed to overthink it. Which is high. Okay, like, 10, is, 10 is amazing. 10, 10 is, is good. Like the okay, OG okay. flaw. 10 is like, you know, it's a good flaw. Okay. 10 is fitting orphans for a villain. Uh, is it that? <laughs> one is, is I don't know. Uh, you'll tell me what a one is. Okay. Oh, okay. Are we so rating I'll, these I'll in terms of whether they're flaws or whether they're positive traits? They're or rating these in terms of writing. how much we like them? Context. Con- how good. about we just rate them? Good writing flaws. Good okay? writing flaws. Okay. okay. So I'm going to start a sentence. What if your villain is... Mm, Okay. Okay. Right. And you got to just shout without thinking too much, one to ten, and <laughs> try to shout in a way that both of you are heard. I don't know how to figure it out. So I, I'm, I'm literally going to do this um, randomly, and hopefully this goes well. Okay, are you ready? Ready. What if your main character is gossipy? Good. Uh, eight. <laughs> Hey, <laughs> Ali, Ali, you failed. Uh, yeah, like, like, so, no, the, the good was, uh, that threw me. <laughs> On a scale of one to ten to good. Um, yeah, no, maybe like a, a seven. Yeah. A gossipy main character. Okay. Definitely. They'll get in, they'll get in trouble. They'll get into so much trouble. Yeah. <laughs> okay. What, what if your villain is naive? Two. And two. Yeah, not good. No. <laughs> okay. What if your main character is uh, da, 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 awkward? Mm, yeah, seven. eight. Okay, ten and an eight. That's a pretty high score. No. Okay, what about a villain that is prideful? Ten. Oh yeah. Prerequisite. Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's like <laughs> that's pretty. That's like. Let's see. What about? Can you imagine it? 
<laughs> like a like a in an insecure villain. You, your story's not going anywhere. Are you scared? <laughs> are you scared? Is this scary for you? Because scary. It's scary for me. Is it scary for you? Are you are you having a good it's time? A terrible villain trait. <laughs> kind of like muster up the army to go out to war, and it's just like oh God. only if you want. Don't put yourselves out. <laughs> I know it's not a great cause, but like, please. <laughs> Do you think the troll's big enough? Is the troll big enough? Okay. Um, what if your hero is dishonest? Oh, uh, yeah, that's, 10. That's eight, nine. That's a 10. Mm. Nice. We all make your heroes liars, guys. We love it. Um, okay, I'm just going to throw a word that I am not sure I understand. Let's see. <laughs> what if your villain is hedonistic? <laughs> our hero sorry or our villain our villain our villain oh 10 <laughs> yeah it's kind, of, kind of a standard villain thing um i feel like a, a hedonistic uh hedonistic main character could be a lot of fun <laughs> yeah especially because there's like a, a reclaiming at the moment of queer coded villains as well like mm. we're in the like age of that so yeah 10 <laughs> I'm going to throw a curveball. I was saving the curveball for round five. I have no idea how many rounds we've done. Um, what if the mentor, what if the mentor of our hero is ignorant? Oh. <laughs> He's got no clue. Initially, I scoffed, but I'm actually, I'm like, that's amazing. Like, hey. Yeah. He knows just one thing. He knows just one thing. He's going to teach it to you. Everything else, nada. Oh, I was even thinking the thing that he teaches is just wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he that's... sends the character off into the storyline. That, that, that's an amazing <laughs> plot you've just put yeah. in motion. That's great plot. So I'm thinking of bad Dumbledore, like just as the quotation marks, bad Dumbledore mentor. So it, we all laugh in hindsight. What if Filch? What if Filch was headmaster? <laughs> well, that's not as good because you need like. They got to sound like they know what they're talking about. You trust yeah. them all the way into the end. Oh, like, oh bad man. Dumbledore threw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> That's not. Wait, I need a number. I'm not. I'm not leaving without a number. Oh yeah, no, it, it's like an eight, seven yeah, or an eight. Feel like an eight. Feels like you got some fun with that. <laughs> okay, uh, it's it's a bit similar. Let's let's do a more straightforward one. Um, what about a hero that is morally gray? Oh, that ten. that's that's a ten. Yeah. That's my. Yeah. That's a good I, lo I love yeah. that. That's that's the shit. Okay, what about a hero that is possessive, like Edward Cullen in Twilight, which is what the website is saying. It, it's uncomfortable if that's what you want. It is very it's hard to redeem, but a good challenge. Like you've written yourself a plot if that's what you're going to try and do, rather than accidentally writing. Yeah, it's not a quality you're added afterwards. That's like mm. central. That's very central. So like that's going to have to be so closely tied to the plot. Yeah. Uh, really interesting. I, I'm thinking of examples that are just so Edward Cullen. I don't think was like written to be. Like, I don't think that was written to be a bad trait, if you know what I mean. I feel like yeah, that, yeah. that's something that's come about from bad writing um, rather than intentional. <laughs> I'm going to make this character overcome this flaw. Um, if you're doing it intentionally, an amazing flaw. That gets an eight from me. If you've just, if you've tried to write a romance and you've written a possessive character that makes everyone uncomfortable, then that's not the same thing. <laughs> Uh, that's a very good breakdown. I'll, I'll just let you know that these 70 uh, character flaws were actually uh, put into tiers of bad, ugly, and like bigoted with a skull icon. And <laughs> we're now getting into those. Ah. We're not getting into those. So expect, uh, expect yeah. the good stuff. Okay. What is your hero? Is a fanatical? Oh, yeah. That's great. I love that. That's 10. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what kind of literature you guys read, but you guys <laughs> really dig the, the assholes. We're thinking, I'm, I'm thinking Moby Dick here. Like. <laughs> oh, but even just right. something as simple as, so I've written a short story called Sons of the Division uh, coming out in a, yeah. uh, a Quill and Reed Tales from Nether and Free, free Easy. <clears throat> Plug. Plug. Yeah. Um, and so that has a 14-year-old boy who he doesn't know he's in a cult. Um, and the well, cult's well, all... He doesn't know? No, well, he's just like, yeah, uh, this is my family. We go around and we make people happy. Um, <laughs> and and so the audience, you're reading this and you're meant to be kind of like horrified. Um, and it, and the arc is the 14-year-old boy kind of being like, maybe the stuff my 
the institution I'm a part of is not okay. Um, so that is a protagonist works really well. It, it drives yeah. the plot. If, if I'm to use an example of my own writing. <laughs> I, say, I love the idea of a character who is maybe <laughs> fanatical and misguided and um, what they're doing ends up being good. At the same time, mm. <laughs> you're writing horror, which I quite often like doing, if you have a character who thinks they're great mm-hmm. and as the story plays out, you realize they're a complete fanatic and they've just got completely the wrong idea and what they're doing is terrible. <laughs> that, that's great horror, yeah. That is great horror. Um, I'll just say, I wonder if I should have had a list of good traits for the villains. Like, what if the villain is a really nice guy? Um, <laughs> also amazing, 10. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go with this what if your mentor is paranoid oh that's good yeah 11 yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay we got two more and i don't want to i don't want to attack someone but i feel like uh ellie i think your book is full of those um what if your main character is self-destructive <laughs> <laughs> Not a personal attack, okay? (laughs) Why does every character have self-destructive tendencies? Yeah, no, um, 12, yeah. (laughs) I'm I'm a fan of this. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. I give that a 10. I like that a 10. I think that works really well if um, they often couple that with, like, addiction. And if addiction is, like, written well, if there's a kind of almost a back and forth of the character trying to maybe go the right path and they backslide a little bit and go the right path and backslide a little bit. I think that makes for great, um, I think you empathize with that character very, very quickly. I think self-destructiveness can work well to a point. At some point, I don't like the relapses so much. I kind of struggle mm, with those. Okay. I like when it's a thing they start with and they, once they are made aware of it, I'm, I'm allowing one slip. <laughs> the second slip, I'm gone. Like, Okay, you slipped once, they picked you up, we're probably 80% into the novel. If you get that last slip at 95% of the novel, I kind of feel cheated of the process that you went through. Interesting. Like, so what are we even, why are we even doing this? You know, like, if you're just <laughs> going to go back to your old ways, I'm not interested. Even if it is a tragedy you've signed up for, if that's the structure, like, do you need your, your regression flagged for you to be able to enjoy it? You see, in my head canon, Oedipus is fine. You know, he made yeah. it out. He's okay. He, he's, he's great. He, he figured it out with his mom. That's, uh, <laughs> in my head canon. You'll be a good beta reader for uh, Cyprus then. <laughs> and what I'm trying to do there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> great. <clears throat> well, this has gone, this game has gone well. Uh, basically what I'm gaining for this is just uh, pick like seven absolutely terrible traits, put them <laughs> in your character and go from there. And that makes for a good time. What we got left for today, we're going to do uh, a reading from Ali. Uh, but before we go into Ali's reading, we're going to do a quick what have you read for me recently slash wrote. James, you start so Ali can slide straight into her writing. Oh, uh, yeah. Not a whole lot of reading this week. Um, but I did watch the film The Last Duel, the Ridley Scott one. Uh, I thought it was brilliant, actually. Yeah. Um, there's a couple of things that he did in it which I normally don't like in films kind of the way he structured it and stuff but uh, I felt it was really good in this film I felt that uh, a lot of great little visual cues and stuff that kind of changed the way you interpreted characters which I think mm. spoke to uh, mm. the acting of uh, Jimmy Cormer and then like just the direction and style so yeah I actually thought it was really really brilliant and I'd advise anyone to go go check it out like it's really good okay uh, spoiler alert James is I'm a faint-hearted person who likes to read them right horror um is the ending is it very tragic a little tragic or spoiler alert um it's it's fine (laughs) (laughs) guys if you're not watching the video he kind of smiled in a way that makes you feel that it's not really fun (laughs) so i wouldn't trust this as a recommendation (laughs) i went into the the final act thinking like how are they gonna finish this like as a writer i was like how does this, how do you play this out? Like, but then I realized it was a true story. Um, and I kind of had this moment of like, given some of the stuff that's happened in it, because it's quite graphic in places, I was like, I really don't want this to go the direction I think it's going to go in, because I'm just, I don't want to see how this plays out. Yeah, but it, it was okay. <laughs> You'll be all right. All right. Um, thank you, James. Uh, real, real quick, I'm about to start reading Treasure Island, which I never have read. Uh, I have watched the DreamWorks Treasure Planet. I recommend it. But um, 
Yeah, I'm going to go into it. It's one of those classics that I just want to catch up on. Reading or audiobook? Reading. Should I? I already have the physical copy. Was that a mistake, Ali? No, no, just fun fact. My partner's done an audiobook reading of Treasure Island. <laughs> so I'm like, if oh, you put your headphones shit. in and suddenly got Nathan, like that was going to be a moment for you. <laughs> <laughs> That is such a good plug. I mean, it's not even a plug. It's just a great thing. To, yeah, to he's not going to get extra royalties for it. I mean, he's already done it. So, <laughs> so guys, if you haven't read Treasure Island, please get the audiobook <laughs> version. Please get it in Australia. And if you hear someone with an American accent, you got the wrong one. Um, great. Uh, Ali, the, I'll take the stage back for a quote in the end. But until then... Please go ahead. Sure. Um, yes, I don't have a lot of media to share um, this week. I, I tried to have a think about it and I'm like, yeah, I'm just still reading Moby Dick and otherwise I'm not watching anything too exciting at the moment. Um, but uh, in lieu of that, I've been doing a lot of writing. Um, I'm working on a couple of different things at the moment and I am perpetually editing Cyprus forever. Um, and it works. I, I thought this could be a good uh, reading because I found this snippet that I've recently been playing with. I don't know if it works because I kind of ripped it out of one section, put it at the start of another section. Anyway, it's in progress. Um, but it basically does a, a little job of wrapping up my main character and his flaws and all his nonsense and all the things that, um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that hopefully readers enjoy about what Cyprus can do. So Van Diemen's Land, August 1829. Canvas was found for Jack Molderman's body. He was wrapped thrice and set beside the larboard rail for when spare hands and minds could deliver him the attention he was deserved. Will had witnessed the ceremony many times beyond counting. The Belle Pool in particular had ferried numerous souls from this world. Yet when the pretty hen had not claimed his, Will had thought for sure that his final hours would be aboard the Florida. She'd been one of the proudest frigates Will had ever sailed, and as the master's first mate, she and him had found plenty of opportunities to tumble and fool about the seas together. A modern girl, she flounced her sleek trail boards, which provided extra protection to her forecastle bulkhead. Her waist was slender for a three-master, allowing for a narrow gap between her bulwarks and foredeck. Her jib, booms had, her jib booms had been extremely long, creating a forward triangle within which the sailors could set more jibs. Her bowsprit and extensions had been supported by an elaborate forked martingale and her entire structure strengthened by additional rigging. She'd been strong, all told, and to recall that she now lay in her seabed grave no more than rotted wood and splinters struck Will with a potent, irrational melancholy. He'd left the cap captaincy of the Liberty to dance with the Florida around the Mediterranean. To him, she had promised the riches of more exotic cargo as well as new lands and unexplored harbours. He'd wanted more from life and she'd provided. For two years they'd been together and she'd sated his needs and pushed their voyages just that little bit further to take on that extra load, to reach the furthest port. He'd sailed closer and closer to the setting sun, his wings burning, and then the bitch had sunk. The wisdom of nine years hindsight, he wondered that if she'd stayed afloat, would Will have needed to chase his thrills elsewhere among the unguarded crates of Sunderland's marina. Would he be entrusting his eternal soul to the Cyprus here and now, just as Jack Molderman had done? Survive, William. That's my little reading. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, that was the most, uh, you know, electric descriptions of a relationship between a man and a boat. <laughs> when you say go the furthest port, my mind went completely elsewhere. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had to keep reminding myself, this is a boat. This is not a woman. This is a boat. This is not a woman. <laughs> Which would just great, great stuff. Yeah. For, and for extra context, so much of this book is this character's like love affairs and that he is, he does cheat on his wife and things like that. So um, those layers are intentional that your mind goes in those directions. Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we're just going to say it was really nice to host and have you guys and talk to you about the worst in humankind. Um, we're gonna <laughs> say goodbye with a quote by a person who knew a little bit about character flaws, Ernst Hemingway. And this is what he says. He says, a writer should create living people. People, not characters. A character is a caricature. And with that, we are going to say goodbye. Thank you for listening and have a beautiful week. This was the Closing Homes Podcast.
Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> You're listening to Pros and Cons, the Prespice Fiction Podcast. <laughs>